So over the next three months, we traveled all around the country. We talked to owners and, and uh, we talked to the union that represented players. And this is, uh, this is key uh, in this story because, ladies and gentlemen, what it did is I had, the, I had the advantage for three months to look deep inside a business that I badly wanted to be a part of. But I only wanted to be a part of it if I could succeed at it. And I hope, if, if you don't remember anything else that I say today, I hope you'll remember this, that knowledge really is power. And that's why I'm telling you your education is critical. But then when you, you finally get to that point in your life, and it happens for some people at age 18 and others age 45, when you get to that point in your life where you can develop a passion about being part of a, a business, a certain direction, when you get to that point in your life, I submit the key for you will be to spend enough time to look deep inside the business, to talk to people who know, and really understand what the difference is between success and failure. Now, I could spend the next hour, we don't have an hour, telling you what Bain and Company concluded about why some teams were constantly good and other teams were never good. But I'll give you just a few key snippets. And uh, rather than uh, try to, to draw on the board, I'll just kind of tell you about the analysis that we did in five minutes. And hopefully you can uh, follow this. It's, it's actually pretty simple. We started out with the premise that, that good teams always were winning teams. Boy, we, we're really brilliant, aren't we? So we said, let's plot on one axis winning teams and on the other axis, let's, let's plot attendance. And sure enough, this won't surprise Kevin or anyone else who's been involved in selling tickets, a winning team, a winning team creates interest. So when we plotted that on a graph, sure enough, um, there's a perfect, not, not just a, 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 a high correlation, but almost a perfect correlation between teams that win and teams that draw fans. So we said, well, okay, What's the next step? The next step is to get your microphone working. No. The next step is, um, now that we understand that winning and attendance is perfectly positioned, let's plot investment. So total dollars spent versus winning. Is there a correlation there? And sure enough, there was a strong correlation. Not quite as perfect, but there was a correlation between teams that spent money on players and teams that won. So now these highly paid uh, consultants from uh, Boston, these highly, highly compensated consultants really have arrived at a great conclusion. All you have to do is invest money, and if you invest enough money in players and win, you're going to draw people and therefore you're going to be profitable. But it wasn't quite that easy. We then said, let's, let's actually plot a talent index Let's take every player on every NBA team and let's go through and come up with a talent index to rate the best kind of teams. And we'll give, we'll give every player points based on positive statistics, assists and field goal percentage and rebounds. And, and then let's take, negative, let's take a negative score for turnovers and personal fouls and ejections and all of those things. And let's come up with our own rating system so that we could develop a talent index. And when we finished that, we plotted talent index against, uh, talent index against uh, winning percentage. And sure enough, our talent index had a perfect correlation. So now we were feeling really smart, Alan. We could have gotten an A in your class, I think. We were feeling really smart. We had concluded that, that sure enough, investing in talent, the right talent, the right kind of talent, led to profitability at the franchise. But we started to see something a little bit different when we did that. There's, there's some outliers here, though, in our analysis. There, were, there was a team in Portland that was profitable every year despite not having the most talent. There was a team in Dallas, the Dallas Mavericks, that had the most, they were the most profitable team in the league, and yet they didn't have the highest degree of talent. We started to find these outliers. And when we, when we found those, we went immediately to those cities and spent time with all of those organizations. And this is where we found something that concerns you. 
Because what we found in those cities, those outliers that were profitable, successful, and yet not necessarily invested the most in talent, we found educated, driven, properly incented business management. Now the Jazz, the Utah Jazz at that point, were by far the worst franchise in the NBA. And because it was in my hometown, I began to do some research on why that was. And sure enough, we found at the Jazz what we found in many other franchises. They had, they had put a general manager in place who lacked business education, who was actually a high school history teacher, and then a coach, and then a pro coach, and then the owner said, well, we gotta do something with Mr. X, so let's put him in the front office. Let's, make, let's put him in charge of the club. But for, a, for someone with that kind of a background to suddenly be dealing with <coughs> deferred compensation and present values of money and negotiating television agreements and trying to structure seating around market segmentation, all of which you need to do in sports. That was way over most of their heads. So these, these franchises that had put these kind of people in place really were lacking the leadership and direction and the management skills that you can learn in uh, school and uh, learning running, it, because it's the very same set of skills in other businesses. Well, so we bid on the Celtics after three months. We thought we understood exactly what it was gonna take to turn the Celtics into even more of a powerhouse. They had a very good set of uh, executives in sports. They still were lacking on the business side of things. We knew we could add some value that way. And so we bid on the Celtics, but we, uh, as often happens in sports, somebody came in and blew us right out of the water and outbid us by about $4 million. Boston Celtics were sold in 1984 for $28 million. And uh, we thought we were bidding a, a healthy price. The rumor was they were gonna sell for 17 or 18. So we bid 23 and we, as I say, we got blown out of the water. Today, the Celtics are worth somewhere north of 500 million. So those guys have done pretty well on that, I guess, many years later. But the reason they've done well is that they have they've not only hired terrific general managers and basketball people, but they've hired very, very capable sales and marketing, <coughs> and especially management people.